shopping. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon. This is Lauren Wenzel. I'm uh, here presenting our monthly NPR webinar series, and today's topic is Inspiring Ocean and Climate Literacy and Conservation Through Marine Protected Areas. And I'm really pleased to introduce Claire Fackler, our, our speaker today. And before I do that, I also want to just thank our partners, Open Channels and EBM Tools Network, for their uh, involvement and support for this uh, monthly webinar series. So Claire is the National Education Liaison for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and has worked for NOAA for the past 16 years to bring the ocean into America's classrooms and homes uh, with a mission to inspire ocean and climate literacy and conservation through national marine sanctuaries. She works with various partners on national and regional educational programs that enhance public awareness, understanding, and appreciation of the marine environment. And she supports numerous programs such as Thank You Ocean, and in 2013, she was awarded the Sea to Shining Sea Award for Excellence in Interpretation and Education for a program that she developed called Ocean for Life. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, and she is, has a passion for ocean conservation uh, and the oceans. So Claire, really happy that you're here, and I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Lauren, for the introduction, and welcome, everyone. So I start with the photo of the blue planet here. You know, one ocean does connect all of us around the globe, and no matter where we are and live on planet Earth, we are connected to this large global ocean. And really by studying and educating people about the ocean, we're learning how to improve stewardship of the planet and of ourselves. So for those of you on the call here, um, I'll get a better sense of who you are by having you participate in this brief poll. So if I can have Lauren or Sarah initiate the poll, and I'll have you just take a minute. I want to get a sense of who my audience is. So go ahead and select one of those, um, who you are. Probably give you another 10 or 15 seconds to have a response. All right. If it looks like we have good participation on the poll, we can go ahead and wrap it up. Yeah, we're at 92% now, so I think that's great. And if you can show the results of the poll, then that'll be wonderful. Okay, so it looks like the majority of you are just interested members of the community that want to learn a little bit more about National Marine Sanctuaries and education and outreach. And then we have um, a number, 13% of you are MPA managers or staff. Uh, several of you, a good percentage of 21, are informal educators. We have some outreach coordinators and formal educators. So thank you for doing that poll. I appreciate it. Go ahead and close the poll down. So here you're looking at a map of our system of marine protected areas that NOAA manages. Uh, these are federally managed MPAs, and we call them National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, those dots that you see represent these sites, and they're found throughout the coastal United States. Uh, these National Marine Sanctuaries are special ocean areas, or MPAs, that are set aside by Congress to better understand and protect for future generations. Uh, they're like national parks and national forests, yet they're underwater. And currently, our sanctuary system consists of 14 marine protected areas, uh, 13 of which are national marine sanctuaries, and one is our Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. So right now, the system encompasses more than 170,000 square miles of ocean and Great Lakes treasures, from Washington State to the Florida Keys and from Lake Huron to American Samoa. Uh, we are in the process of letting communities nominate new national marine sanctuaries. And just a few days ago, President Obama announced that there are two sites. They're not shown on this map, but one is in Lake Michigan off in Wisconsin, and one is in Mallows Bay in the Potomac River. And these sites are going to just start initiating the designation process, which is very stakeholder driven, to potentially become um, our next national marine sanctuaries. 
So I'm just going to give you a brief little tour. Uh, we've got here uh, four. I'm actually physically in Santa Barbara, California, and we've got four national marine sanctuaries in our state of California. The photo here is from our Channel Islands off the coast of Santa Barbara Ventura. We also, moving up the coast, have our contiguous United States largest sanctuary, which is Monterey Bay, and then moving up to Cordell Bank and Underwater Mountain off of Point Reyes, and the Greater Fairlawns National Marine Sanctuary, which just several months ago expanded um, and nearly doubled in size. Uh, if you move a little further up the coast, we've got one in the Pacific Northwest called the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. If you move now across the country off of Boston, Massachusetts, this is a photo from our Stellwagen Bank site. We have a couple of sites that are specifically designated and set aside um, for the cultural heritage or the mar maritime archaeology elements. So this pictured here is our Monitor National Marine Sanctuary off of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And then our other one is in Lake Huron. Uh, it's called Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, or also known as Shipwreck Alley. We have a large protected area around the Florida Keys. This photo here is from Gray's Reef off of Savannah, Georgia. We have one in the Gulf of Mexico. This is our Flower Garden Banks Sanctuary. It's about 110 miles off the Texas-Louisiana border in the Gulf. And it's a really interesting spot in terms of having these salt domes that have formed on the edge of the continental shelf. And then they have these coral reefs that are very colorful and vibrant. We have two of our sites in the Hawaiian Islands. One is the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary even though I'm showing you a picture of a dolphin. <laughs> they primarily um, deal with a single species of the humpback whale. But that site is actually going through a management plan review process right now with their communities to try to make it more of an ecosystem-based managed um, marine protected area. And then the second one is our Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument in the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And we have one even in one of our USA territories. Uh, this is in American Samoa. It used to be one of our it used to be our country's smallest national marine sanctuary at about a quarter square miles, which earlier this year became our country's largest national marine sanctuary of the system. So in the continental United States, Monterey Bay is our largest site, and then in the whole system, including territories, this American Samoa. National Marine Sanctuary is the largest. Now these areas that I tried to just give you a little visual journey of some of them and um, but they're set aside because there's either you know special biological or ecological, historical, conservation, cultural, archaeological, archaeological or aesthetic qualities for these ocean areas or Great Lake areas that communities or Congresses wanted to set aside. So this language you're looking at comes directly from our National Marine Sanctuaries Act. And before I move on, I want to talk a little bit about the word sanctuaries. So when I, you know, we call our federally managed marine protected areas, they're called National Marine Sanctuaries. When I think of the word sanctuaries personally, I think of like a fully protected sort of no-take area. And when you look up the word sanctuary in a dictionary, it actually, one of the definitions is any place of refuge. So that kind of goes in line with what my personal thought is. But I feel it's a little bit of a misnomer with our sanctuary system because our sanctuaries, they actually promote, or they, sorry, they allow commercial, like this commercial fishing boat, and recreational, like this fisherman. So commercial and recreational uses, yet we promote conservation and sustainable uses such as diving and kayaking and just enjoying and surfing some of these sustainable uses of our sites. But that's an important element for people to understand is that national marine sanctuaries, we promote conservation, but we actually allow commercial and recreational uses. And we're trying to ensure they're as sustainable as possible. So let's talk a little bit about some of the mandates and guiding documents for us. We, in 1972 as a country, put together the National Marine Sanctuaries Act. 
And so this act um, directs everything that we do, and it's been revised several times between when it was developed in 72 and now. But in terms of education and outreach, it actually calls out that National Marine Sanctuaries will support, promote, and coordinate efforts to enhance public awareness, understanding, and appreciation of National Marine Sanctuaries. So we actually are mandated to do education and outreach in per our legislative act. We're also mandated to do research and monitoring and resource protection and of course management of these sites. But um, that, you know, a lot of other MPAs may not have that type of mandate to, to do education and outreach specifically, whereas we do have that luxury within sanctuaries. And then if you kind of come down the food chain a little bit, you know, there is a NOAA Office of Education and they have an education strategic plan. The mission of NOAA education in general is to educate and inspire the nation to use science toward improving ocean and coastal stewardship, increasing safety and resilience to environmental hazards, and of course preparing a future workforce to support NOAA's mission. So all of our work must not only align with our mandate, but then fit under this larger NOAA education strategic plan. And then if you drill down a little bit deeper, on the top right here, we've got the National Ocean Service Roadmap. So our part of NOAA that we fit under is the Ocean Service. And there's a roadmap there, and it's one of the parts of the roadmap is talking about developing and implementing targeted educational programming designed to enhance coastal and ocean stewardship. And then you take a step down even further just into our own office, the NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and we, we have a strategic plan that actually is just now expiring, and our leadership team is in the process of developing a new strategic plan. But based on the existing plan, we, uh, let's see, we fit within the different elements of you know, public awareness and understanding and appreciation. So again, it just reinforces that we need to be doing outreach and education and interpretation. Okay. Another element that's important for us is this America Competes Act. So COMPETES actually is an acronym and it stands for Creating Opportunities to meaningful, Meaningfully Promote Excellence in Technology, Education, and Science. So the America Competes Act of 2007, and this actually directed NOAA and really helped solidify our NOAA Office of Education that we are to carry out and support research-based programs to increase student interest and participation in STEM. And STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. We're supposed to improve public literacy in those categories. We need to work on improving student learning and teaching STEM. And this is through different ways like curriculum support, um, you know, ensuring that we do our best to align our materials to the next generation science standards, which really promote STEM. And of course, lastly, number five, to create and support opportunities for enhanced and ongoing professional development for teachers. So we not only have all those mandates and guiding documents that were in the previous slide, but now with the America Competes Act of 2007, it gives NOAA even more authority to get involved in, in this type of work. And then we, within the National Marine Sanctuaries, our education team, we have over, I don't know, maybe over 40 or 50 staff around the country that work on education, outreach, and interpretation for our National Marine Sanctuaries. We have put together a strategic plan that we're smack dab in the middle of, and the, you can see the vision there. Ideally, we're aiming for an ocean literate public that can make informed environmental decisions. So when they're voting, they're thinking about not only the economy, but they're thinking about the environment and future generations. And how we do this, our mission is to inspire ocean and climate literacy and conservation through national marine sanctuaries. So those words, climate literacy and ocean literacy, might be new to some of you. Uh, but to give you a sense, I don't know, probably over a decade ago, a group of educators through the National Marine Educators Association 
came together. We had NOAA, NASA, National Geographic, tons of universities, lots of individuals, and it was determined we needed to come up with, you know, a way to ensure that our students that come through the K-12 system in the United States, that they have a general understanding of the ocean's influence on them and their influence on the ocean. So there are seven essential principles that make up ocean literacy, and I mean, some of them are kind of so basic, you're, you know, it's shocking to think that someone that graduates from high school may not know these, but in many cases they don't. But so basic such as there's one large interconnected global ocean and that we're all connected to it no matter where we live. You know, it's hard because people talk about Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, and then they say the oceans. And so for a lot of people, they never really think about the fact that those are ocean basins yet it's all one large interconnected global ocean. So I'm always fighting for singular ocean. So for those of you that perhaps catch yourself saying oceans, let's all together just continue to just make that singular because there is only one ocean on planet Earth. And another one of the pr essential principles is that our ocean on planet Earth makes our planet habitable without our ocean, we can't live on planet Earth. That's a pretty big deal. And of course, the ocean's a major influence on weather and climate. And there's, you know, there's three or four more essential principles, but if you Google ocean literacy, you can find out more about that. Uh, there is also uh, a similar thing related to climate literacy. So really, it's a guide for individuals and communities to understand climate and climate science and some of the basic things that they should know um, regarding carbon emissions and some of the issues related to that. So we like to think of our National Marine Sanctuaries as living classrooms. I mean, these are the place-based locations that people can go. They can see and touch and learn about these underwater treasures, right? I mean, if they're not snorkelers or divers, um, you can certainly get them onto the surface of the water through stand-up paddle boards or kayaks or on boats. Um, you can get students and teachers into tide pools, which are, you know, in many cases, like in our Monterey Bay Sanctuary, all the way up to mean high tide as part of this MPA. Uh, so really, they are the living classrooms, and we try our best to take advantage of that. So now I wanted to just kick off with a little ocean inspiration for you here before I dive into some of the programs. Oh gosh, I'm sorry guys. All right, we're not. The ocean takes care of us. Let's return the favor. Our most precious resource needs your help now. Go to thankyouocean.org to find out what you can do. Sorry for the brief interruption in that video. But I just wanted to give you a little inspiration. That's a 60 second public service announcement that we created for the Thank You Ocean campaign. And Thank You Ocean is primarily focused in the state of California, and it's a nonprofit partnership supported by the state of California's Natural Resource Agency and our Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Um, and the campaign mission is to unite voices and to amplify messages to raise ocean awareness and to promote everyday actions that protect the ocean. So the quality of video you just saw through the webinar wasn't the greatest, but we have high resolution, you know, broadcast quality version of that PSA in 60 seconds 
and in 30 seconds, as well as in English and in Spanish. And we have some other related videos. So um, certainly during the Q&A, if people want an information on the link to that, let me know. Now I dive into how we bring the ocean into America's classroom. And we do this through formal and informal education programs and public outreach, as well as interpretation. So now I'm just going to share a couple of ideas uh, with you um, of what we do to bring the ocean into America's classrooms. Some of what we do is provide teacher professional developments. So we use hands-on, standards-based uh, ocean science activities that will excite the teacher's students about science and technology and possibly some engineering. The picture on the left, you're looking at some staff that are doing a mock shipwreck activity where teachers are learning how scientists and maritime archaeologists go underwater and actually do trilateration and triangulation of the uh, shipwrecks. And that involves science and, and technology and math. The photo on the right is um, during one of our dive into education teacher workshops where we bring a wide variety of professional development opportunities and lesson plans and curricular materials to teachers. And here they're in the field doing one of our programs. We also try through most of our education and outreach programs and products to promote just a general understanding of what NOAA is and the fact that we have this system of national marine sanctuaries. So that's, um, you know, one of our biggest things is just basic awareness of sites that we have. And another element of the programs that we do is, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do is change behavior of the people that we interact with, the students, the teachers, the community members. We're really trying to encourage responsible stewardship of the ocean and the Great Lakes treasures um, and really trying to get that behavior change. So touching on just a, a few of the programs that we offer, this program here is one of our field programs. It's called LIMPITS. It's a sh an acronym for the Long-Term Monitoring Program and Experiential Training for Students. And it's an environmental monitoring and education program that we do in the state of California. And it's for students, teachers, informal educators, and volunteer groups. Uh, currently, we have approximately 5,500 teachers and students along the coast of California that are involved in the collection of this rocky inner tidal and sandy beach data as part of our Limpets network. And Limpets is um, something certainly that can be packaged and potentially expanded to different areas, uh, species dependent. But we're in the process with this program of enhancing the scientific credibility of it, of it. So we're going through that with many members of our science advisory panel. Another program I wanted to mention is Ocean for Life. Now this is a really unique program because it's a little broader than just thinking about national marine sanctuaries. We bring together Middle Eastern and North American high school students of diverse cultures and backgrounds to study ocean science and in the course of that to break down stereotypes and hopefully ultimately strengthen our global relationships. And this program actually came into being because on September 11th, 2001, we had three sixth grade students, their three teachers and two of our National Geographic colleagues that boarded a plane in DC and were on their way to our Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary off of California to have a field experience. And they were on a plane that was hijacked and crashed into the Pentagon. So we stopped and tried to come up with a way to use our National Marine Sanctuaries as living classrooms and to bring these really diverse cultures together to really promote cross-cultural understanding between these different cultures, uh, all through the idea of having a greater appreciation of the ocean and understanding how the ocean connects all of us, no matter where we live. And students participate in cultural sharing activities, marine science, conservation and stewardship, um, as well as a media camp where they photo and video document their Ocean for Life experience. And then when they return home, they share those videos with their friends, their families, schools, and local communities uh, 
to start what they become, which is our ambassadors of change. Now, because that's a two-week immersive program, we spend a lot of time on formative and summative evaluation. So I just wanted to touch on some of the results of this program to show you how we interpret some of the information. So we've done four of those Ocean for Life field studies since 2009 with 30 students in each one of them. And we do students participate in pre and post field study evaluations, a one-year follow-up, and a three-year follow-up. So these results are based on all of the students that completed the evaluation that participated in Ocean for Life. And basically, as a result of the program, you know, 100% of our students a year afterwards, you know, they recognize the National Marine Sanctuary System helps to protect the ocean and Great Lake ecosystems. They realize that we're connected to the ocean in many important ways. They accept that climate change is real and happening. They realize that the choices that they make today will, will affect future generations. They're concerned about climate change and how it may impact their lives and future generations as well as the ocean. They have an enhanced knowledge of ocean conservation and stewardship, and they have a better understanding of different countries and cultures. So not all of our programs do this really long longitudinal evaluation like the one-year, five-year, et cetera, follow-up, uh, but this particular program we are executing a long-term evaluation and really trying to see where we are going in, in terms of behavior change. Moving on to another sort of hands-on program that helps bring uh, the ocean and technology into the classroom. We have many of our national marine sanctuaries around the country, particularly in Thunder Bay and Monitor and Grace Reef, that host ROV competitions. ROVs are remotely operated vehicles and through collaboration and partnership with the MATE Center, they are able to uh, teach students about the technology. So the picture on the right is of a real ROV, and a picture on the left is of a, a female high school student that she and her team built this PVC pipe ROV and are going to be launching it in the pool for a mission. So there's just different ways you can engage students. And of course, the tie-in to National Marine Sanctuaries with a program like this is that we use that, te that technology in our place-based locations, and students can then emulate that through their PVC pipe or Lego-built ROVs. We also have programs that um, offer grants. We're, you know, the National Marine Sanctuary System has been around for 43 years, so it's only in the last decade or a little longer that we have now money set aside to give to communities and schools and, and nonprofits. So this is an example of one of them. It's our Bay Watershed Education and Training Grants. We call them BWET. It was established in 2002. The idea is to improve the understanding of environmental stewardship of students and teachers through education. And so we use the outdoors. It doesn't have to be the ocean or a great lake. It can be a river, a stream, a bay, a beach, or the surrounding landscape. And we're really trying to use that outdoor environment to provide the opportunity to teach STEM and reading, social studies, and even art. And so this grant, we're talking in, you know, anywhere from the thirty to $60,000 range. Uh, the eligible applicants are schools, school systems, nonprofits, and other organizations. But it's important to note that um, there's specific states and counties where BWET grants are available to the communities. So you can go to that website link there to find out more about which states and which, which counties and communities. But sort of a spin-off of our BWET grants is in some of those com communities, there's smaller grants in the amount of two to $5,000 for Ocean Guardian schools. So these are schools that are interested in doing school-based or community-based conservation or stewardship projects that will have a positive impact on their watershed that ultimately goes out and leads to our ocean and in some cases our national marine sanctuaries. And so it's, it's a great program, super inspiring. We have lots of measurable impacts of the program. We're collecting data from all of these Ocean Guardian schools, which are primarily in California, yet there are some. There's New York Harbor School, um, 
there's a few other schools around the country as we start to blossom this program beyond the state of California. And we're collecting those measurable impacts. We're getting a sense of what's the reduction of single-use plastic water bottles, how many, what's the acreage of invasive species that have been removed by students, as well as native species, species that have been planted. I mean, this is the kind of information that we're collecting through our Ocean Guardian schools. Now we also have outreach materials to help communicate uh, and just raise public awareness and understanding of our national marine sanctuaries. This is a new, a new poster just hot off the press a couple of weeks ago. It's uh, Deep Sea Coral Communities. It was created by our education team along the West Coast uh, for all the national marine sanctuaries. It is, this poster actually complements a new ocean acidification curriculum because ocean acidification is a big issue for national marine sanctuaries and our global ocean. And so we're doing our best to find ways to get the younger generation and teachers in our communities to understand um, that issue of OA. And so these, it, there's also a video that shows some of these deep sea coral habitats within our national marine sanctuaries along the west coast. So a wide variety of outreach materials. Another one here, it's a available online as, and we do still have printed copies. We have a ocean awareness publication for our national marine sanctuaries along the west coast. Um, you're probably thinking, wow, this is west coast heavy. I think part of it is that I'm physically located, as I mentioned earlier, on the west coast. Um, but also the, the five national marine sanctuaries that are found with along the west coast of the United States, they really are connected by the currents. There's a lot of synergies with them, so that team works really closely on developing a wide variety of products that, that meet the needs of multiple sites. We also just last week launched our new responsive design website. So here's what our new education page looks like. And what we try to do with our online materials is we're trying to provide teachers and other interested parties resources and training that help support ocean literacy and climate literacy in our classrooms and in our different after-school programs and such. So on our website, if you were to go to sanctuaries.noaa.gov slash education, you'll find curriculum, lesson plans, and activities that will excite your students about STEM-related topics. More fun online resources I thought I would just tap on. We've got here the uh, encyclopedia of our National Marine Sanctuaries. If you go to marinelife.noaa.gov, there's two resources on there. One of them is this, where you can drill down to one of our marine protected areas and kind of learn a little bit about the top 100 species of interest there. Um, you can tap on mammals and then from mammals go into baleen whales and then hit humpback whale and see uh, information about that species. Distribution, habitat, diet, um, links to more information, excuse me, et cetera. So the next slide here just shows you uh, what one of those species cards looks like. So this is all online, but this is the California spiny lobster. And I forgot to reconnect my link, but uh, I was going to show you this fun little video of the lobster. But those videos are available online, so maybe that will encourage you to get to our encyclopedia of the sanctuaries to explore it. We also have an umbrella called Ocean Guardian Programs. So I've already introduced you to our Ocean Guardian Schools, which is one of the granting mechanisms that supports this. But there are other ways that we support through our Ocean Guardian Programs. For example, available online for download, and it prints great in black and white, is our Ocean Guardian Activity Book. This is primarily created for students K through 3 and uh, we worked with the NOAA Marine Debris Program on this, so there's information about all of our national marine sanctuaries, as well as these little activities that you're seeing here. Uh, you know, they're learning about marine debris, plastic pollution, trash, and sort of for that age range, you know, what what their the materials in their lunchbox look like, and maybe how they can make some changes. Also, along the line of Ocean Guardian. We have a great Ocean Guardian Kids Club. This is open to all students, kindergarten through eighth grade, around the United States. The idea is that um, a student, either at home or a classroom of students with their teacher, will 
determine through poetry, artwork, collage, short story, you know, what the environment or the ocean means to them. They then fill out a quick little form that they get from our website, uh, mail it in either, either as a classroom or as an individual. And then in turn, they, we send them, this is business card size, it's our Ocean Guardian Kids Club card. They read the pledge on the back if they agree that they're going to try to you know, reduce their eco footprint and promote ocean awareness and pass their knowledge along to others and recycle and all that. They can sign their card and be an official member of our kids club. With that card, we do try to send some educational materials along and fun stuff like bookmarks and if we have stickers or tattoos, that kind of thing. So moving away from Ocean Guardians, but also staying online, we have programs or curricular materials such as this. This is our data in the classroom. So it's part of our NOAA Ocean Data Education Project where we're developing curricular materials for grades 5 through 8. They can actually be scaled up also to high school. Um, and these are for, to help teachers and students use real scientific data that NOAA collects. And they, want, they use the data to explore the dynamic earth processes and understand the impact of environmental events on a regional scale as well as a global scale. So currently the modules we have in data in the classroom include a module that you're seeing here on El Nino. And again, this is real time, well, okay, not super, well, it's real scientific data. I don't know how real time, but certainly within a couple of months, real data. Uh, El Nino, sea level rise, water quality, and ocean acidification are the topic areas that we currently have. Also online is our National Marine Sanctuaries Media Library. So this is an online vault uh, that includes a comprehensive collection of video clips, but primarily high resolution photographs from our National Marine Sanctuaries around the country. We've also recently opened it up to another one of our NOAA Sisters, so the NOAA Office of Exploration and Research has thousands of photos available for download on our media library as well. And really this, you know, if you're in the process of maybe some of you on the call are members of the community from the two new areas that might be designated National Marine Sanctuaries and are going through the stakeholder process, well the best way to start communicating it is through, you know, visual means, through photographs and videos. So having these compelling photos help tell your story visually is a really key element for any underwater resource or you know anything. So we've actually, to date, we've had more than 8 million photos that have been downloaded from our media library here. So it's been a, a successful way for us to get compelling photos of our MPAs out there to the world. And of course, like most groups, we we used to dabble in social media, but now we're taking it a little more seriously. Uh, almost a year ago, we launched our Earth is Blue campaign, and the, we looked at sites like National Geographic and other groups, and there's just a real strong interest in social media followers to have sort of that photo of the day or video of the day or the week. So our Earth is Blue campaign uh, does just that. We provide a photo of the day that's compelling, it has our little tag on it, that Earth is Blue uh, insignia, and a couple sentences about the picture that they're seeing. And then we do a video a week, and the social media channels are listed down at the bottom, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. We're in the process of creating a Tumblr page, and we're really, this is more just public engagement and awareness, so we're trying to increase um, engagement and awareness of our National Marine Sanctuaries through these social media channels. And the whole concept of Earth is Blue comes from when astronauts first look back at our planet. You know, they said, wow, Earth is blue. I mean, over 70% of our planet is covered in the ocean by our large interconnected global ocean that, wow, when you look back at it from space or from that first picture, that blue marble picture from the beginning of my presentation, you know, Earth is blue. And we need to be better understanding our connection to the ocean and our influence on it and its influence on us. So through our social media platforms, we've actually had tremendous success. Once we launched Earth is Blue on Facebook, we had an increase of 167% of followers. 
Um, we're still small potatoes when you consider, you know, rock bands and others, but we have 35,300 plus followers on Facebook. On Twitter, we're just below 50,000 followers. And since we launched Earth is Blue and we include a photo on our tweets, we're up 54%. And then, of course, Instagram, we launched with our Earth is Blue campaign. So we went from zero to almost 7,000 followers in the last year. So social media is a great way to, you know, connect with, audience members that, you know, you're just trying to broaden awareness and maybe get a little bit of engagement. I just wanted to show this awesome photo from Earth is Blue. This was our most popular photo of the year so far. It shows some scientists and researchers out in our Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary off of Boston, Massachusetts. They're studying humpback whales and then bam, the research vessel behind them catches this photo of them and this breaching humpback. So pretty awesome and you can see some of the stats there on the bottom of the screen. So as I'm kind of wrapping up my presentation here to leave time for questions and answer, I wanted to just give you a snapshot of you know how do we know we're making an impact or a positive impact and there's you know I only touched on evaluation on a couple of those programs most of our education programs are being evaluated. We're doing formative and summative evaluation. Some of them, like our multicultural education program, Medito, you know, did an extensive year-long needs assessment to understand the audience and the community before even developing the program. So, I mean, those are all the right way of doing things. Um, and some of, you know, it's really hard to evaluate the impact of outreach materials and if you're putting materials online, you can certainly look at the Google Analytics of how many downloads, but can you really gauge the engagement of the materials and are teachers really using it? So when we have professional development opportunities, that's when we're you know, trying to really get a better sense from the teachers. Are our materials meeting their needs? You know, is it aligning to the next generation science standards and Common Core? Are they using what we give them you know, in their classroom or is it too overwhelming? Or too much work for them to modify. So we do those kinds of evaluations all the time. And then just to give you a little snapshot or infographic of some of our accomplishments, this is for our fiscal year 14, which ended last October. We don't have our numbers quite yet for fiscal year that ended just um, September 30th, a couple weeks ago. But, um, you know, our programs, we work with, you know, 77, almost 78,000 lifelong learners and these are people that we're hoping are becoming more ocean literate and becoming more equipped to make informed environmental decisions, which aligns with our strategic plan. Uh, there's been over a thousand teachers, pre-K teachers, or sorry, pre-K to 12 teachers that we've worked with, and we're trying to encourage them to find ways to bring the ocean into their classroom through our National Marine Sanctuary content. And we've worked with uh, 30, you know, almost 33,000 K-12 students where we're introducing them to ocean and climate literacy and trying to promote conservation all through the context of our national marine sanctuaries. And then of course partnerships is a huge deal. For every dollar that we get from the, the Office of Management and Budget, we're able to translate that into three dollars of value and that's through partnerships of our programs. And then something I didn't touch on at all but through volunteers, like there's lots of community members that would love to be involved to give back to the environment and to their community. And so it's pretty impressive that throughout the sanctuary system, we've got over 10,000 volunteers. Some people, you know, one or two hours and that's their volunteer. Some people that commit, um, I can't think of what some of our volunteer of the year recipients, but we're talking, you know, in the 10, or excuse me, in the three and five thousand hours for the year, like very committed. But all said, when you include all those people together, there's over 10,000 of them in the United States, and the work that they've done to support National Marine Sanctuaries is valued at over three million dollars and is equivalent to 70 full-time employees. So pretty impressive. Now last couple of things, um, some of the lessons we've learned along the way when it comes to education and outreach. You know, if you're starting from scratch, you absolutely want to start by understanding and identifying who your target audience or audiences are. And then once you know who they are, do a needs assessment. That's a front end evaluation. Find out what they need, what they're looking for, what they want, 
And then as you start to think about the design of your program, you're going to determine who those partners are, and not just partners for partner's sake, but who are the effective partners, people that are actually going to make a contribution to this program or project. And then you can start to actually design that project or program. And then throughout the design and the execution of it, you want to be doing evaluation, formative, which happens during the program or the project, and then summative, when if there's an end date to that teacher workshop or Ocean for Life program, doing a summative evaluation and really taking those lessons learned and translating them into improving the program. And it's also, you know, I can't emphasize enough the benefit of partnerships. For National Marine Sanctuaries, partners make up a huge part of what we do. And that's how for every dollar we get, we can translate to adding three additional dollars to our programs and our projects and our materials. So that's a really important element. And then I also um, I want to emphasize that you don't need to recreate the wheel. The sanctuary system, you know, if you're an MPA internationally or you're a state MPA or a tribal MPA, wherever you're from, or if you're with a group that's going to be going down the process of designating a new national marine sanctuary, look. Look at the sanctuary system. Are there programs and projects and materials that you can use or repurpose to fit your needs? I mean, you can still go through a need, you know, identifying your audience and doing a needs assessment and defining your partnerships and creating it. But, you know, by all means, don't start from scratch if you don't have to. Re you know, no sense reinventing the wheel if it's not needed. So with that, I'll leave it for questions. Okay, Claire, thank you very much. Um, we have about 10 minutes left for questions, and so I would like to encourage people to go ahead and write their questions into the question box on the webinar interface. There have been a couple questions come in, but please go ahead and write those questions in. Um, so, Claire, there, were, uh, there was a comment, really, from Jim Reese, who mentions that um, they have created an award-winning plastic and recycling awareness curriculum that matches the national standards for science and uh, also has math literacy and art infused and would like to talk to you more about that. And I would just say that for anyone who's writing in questions or comments, um, you know, we'll get a copy of those and Claire can follow up individually with people because I think there's some great partnership opportunities. Absolutely. Well, I'd love to hear more about that plastic reduction program, so thank you. And Jim also mentions that they would like to add the Ocean Guardian Pledge to their curriculum, and that would be a great way to bring in a lot more students into this program. Yes, wonderful ideas. Thanks. Okay, and then we have um, a question from Carly, who's a student, and she just says that the programs sound amazing and would like to hear more about some of the challenges that you have encountered in implementing these programs, and also, are there other stakeholders besides teachers and students that you're targeting for education? Okay, so to answer your first question, probably one of the larger biggest challenges for us is the financial end. We have, you know, I mentioned the multicultural education program that we do that I didn't highlight specifically, but it's called Marito. You know, it was designed as you should design programs with the front end evaluation, identifying the partnerships and the target audiences, making sure addressing their needs. And it's just highly evaluated, highly successful, profound impacts on the program, yet it was hard to have money for it. I mean, so many people tout the successes of this program, yet when push comes to shove, getting the money to support it was a challenge. And so we have a lot of programs like that that are prove their worth, yet it's hard to find the financial means to support them. And then your second question, so yeah, we do more than target just uh, K-12 education, you know, teachers. Uh, we do. We work a lot with informal educators for after-school programs, and um, you know, summer camps and that type of thing. We try to target, you know, quote unquote, the general public through our social media and through our compelling photos on the media library and such. Um, so it really, there are lots of different audiences that we're working with. Um, many of the programs I focused on today were more of the formal education audiences, and then the outreach with the materials. Um, Great. But and and a couple of people did ask if they could get a copy of the presentation, and that will be posted on the MPA Center website 
uh, marineprotectedareas.noaa.gov, and also on the Open Channels website, we'll have a recording of this whole webinar. So you can look for that there. Um, Okay, another question that came in from Emma Doyle asks, I'd be interested in getting your thoughts on the relative merits and challenges and benefits of in-classroom work versus field-based or outdoor education in terms of building support and understanding of MPAs. Yeah, so we find there's huge value in actually taking advantage of our place-based locations. The fact that we have a physical spot outside of the classroom that we can get students to is of very high value. So there are important things that can occur in the classroom, but our programs that are hands-on and experiential that actually take the students out of that comfort zone into a coastal area, Great Lakes area, or actually into our National Marine Sanctuary physically, um, those are the meaningful watershed experiences that have a really significant impact on the students, and we most of the feedback we get from teachers through our evaluation is those hands-on field programs are hugely beneficial, like it, it re resonates with the students and sticks with them longer than other experiences. Great. I wanted to notice a couple people who commented that the Park Service also manages a lot of ocean area and has ocean education programs and I um, we are going to be featuring the National Park Service's ocean work in next month's webinar on November 12th. So those of you who want to talk about the Park Service more, you should be sure and come back and listen in on that one. Um, yeah, the Park it, Service, yeah, I should mention, I mean, the Park Service is a great partner for many of our, I mean, nationally, but also some of our sites are co-located, like the Channel Islands is a national park and a national marine sanctuary. And so many of our individual MPAs work very closely with the Park Service as a partner. Thanks. Uh, and there's a follow-up question about getting students out on the water in terms of costs and, and how you overcome that. Yeah, so there, there are small grant opportunities that are often in place. And actually, this year is a great year because through the National Park Service um, and other groups, there is something called Every Kid in the Park. So President Obama launched this initiative a couple of weeks ago. The idea is that every fourth grade student in the United States and their family and their teachers are going to be admitted free to any national park or public lands or public waters for the entire school year. So that just launched when the school year or recently and it'll go I think till September of next year. And so the way that people get involved is they um, can go to the Every, Chat, Every Kid in a Park website. The kids do a fun activity where they learn about these natural areas that are found in our United States, and then they can print something up that then allows them into these locations free of charge. There are, um, you know, like the Channel Islands, I'll mention again, the National Park and the Sanctuary off the coast of Santa Barbara, Ventura counties in California. It takes a boat to get out there. So there are grants through the Every Kid in a Park initiative that are open right now. Um, I think it ends up only being about $10 per student, which does not cover, for example, the whole boat trip out, floating classroom, then out to the National Park and the Sanctuary here at the Channel Islands, but it's money moving in that right direction. But yeah, you have to find creative ways and partnerships to be able to bring students out on vessels, out onto the water, for sure. But you can also just do things that are land, you know, shore-based that can have you know, similar experiences. Okay, uh, and another question, how do you keep track of the teachers and schools that have downloaded and implemented some of your online programs? Yeah, so the, the best, most effective way for us is when we've done the teacher workshops, the professional development opportunities, um, tracking them that way so we can actually have the teacher and follow up with them on, and that will do generally like a three or six month follow up and find out, you know, you said when you left our workshop that you were going to actually use these materials in the classroom. Are you actually using them now that you've had three or six months to implement it? And so we can get that information. Another example, we have a curricular materials called uh, Winged Ambassadors and ACES. And in order for you to download the free materials, you just have to put in your email and if you're, you know, a teacher and your name and what school you're at. And then that way we can actually see, you know, what organizations or individuals or schools or teachers are downloading the materials and 
if necessary, although they're, you know, they may not have participated in the workshop, we can then follow up if necessary to get more information of if they found those materials useful, do they have any recommendations for us. So different, there's lots of different ways. Those are a couple examples. Okay. And uh, we've been talking a lot about the oceans, and Mark Peterson writes in a comment saying, don't forget the Great Lakes. And Claire, I know you talked a little bit about Thunder Bay, but maybe you could just touch on some of the Great Lakes education that's going on. Yeah, there's some great stuff happening. Our only national marine sanctuary currently in the Great Lakes is in Lake Huron, Thunder Bay. It's Shipwreck Alley. And they, here's a great way of getting students out on a vessel. They have, in their community of, um, you know, small community, and the community at first was hesitant to have a national marine sanctuary in Alpena, Michigan. And then now the community over, by and large, has embraced it. Um, there's, you know, Thunder Bay beer, and there's a huge visitor center for Thunder Bay, and it's a very big community thing. But they, a member of the community, bought a um, glass-bottom boat and wanted to run tours over the shallow shipwrecks in Lake Huron. And so the sanctuary partnered with them, so they get students out for very minimal cost now onto the water to look down on the shipwrecks through the glass-bottom boat um, because of this collaboration and partnership with this individual from their community that wanted to start a business. So there's lots of creative ways of um, getting kids back on the water. That's the previous question. And then, yeah, we we're, Great Lakes are a big part of our sanctuary system. And with I mentioned the new one that's under um, stakeholder-driven process to potentially become a new National Marine Sanctuary. That's going to be in Lake Michigan, uh, in, based in Wisconsin. So one last question, Claire. I know you talked about impact, but do you have any closing comments that you'd like to make about the link between education and behavior change and how we move kids and, and adults from understanding more about the oceans to taking actions to protect them? Well, I did have this slide, which is pretty complicated, but I'll touch on it to answer your question. So what we use in the National Marine Sanctuary System is Bennett's top model and top is targeting outcomes for programs. So this is his, his model for evaluation. And most people, if they're just doing basic evaluation, are doing the resources through the reactions, right? So how much money did the program cost? Um, what were the activities that we did and the deliverables and the outputs? Who were the participants? You know, what kind of learning styles did they have? And then we asked them, were their expectations met? Did they like the program? Do they plan to use the materials? So that's the, the first four steps, right? So several years ago, our sanctuary system made a commitment to try to move towards, you know, evaluating up to the behavior change element. So KASA actually stands for Knowledge, Attitudes, Skills, and Aspirations. And with our evaluation, we take it to that step and beyond. So we're trying to figure out you know, was their knowledge increased on certain topic areas? Have their attitudes changed about climate issues? Have they gained new skills? Do they have new aspirations? And then, you know, after, for example, at the Ocean for Life program, when the students finish their two-week experience, we measure all of those first five things, and then we, we measure the intent for behavior change. How are these students what are they saying they're going to do? What's their intention? They say, oh my gosh, now that I've learned about these issues, I'm not going to use single plastic water bottles. Gosh, I, I drink out of that for five minutes and then it's going to last a couple hundred years in a landfill if it doesn't get recycled or, or it gets downcycled. But, you know, and they say, well, I'm committing to not using those single-use plastic water bottles anymore and I'm committing to teaching my family and friends and my classmates about some of these issues so that they become ocean literate and can make better decisions. And, you know, so we get their intention. And then, like I mentioned, that particular program, we do the one year and the three year follow up. And we then find out, you told us you intended to make these changes. Have you? Have you done, have you continued to not use single use water bottles? Have you continued to share your knowledge with others? And so we really do try to move into that behavior change element. And then just for kicks, that last thing, SEEC, stands for Social, Economic, and Environmental Conditions. And that's really hard to get to that level because that's basically saying your program directly impacted the environment. Like, that beach is clean because of our program. Like, that's really, or, you know, the 
the Hawaiian monk seal is doing better because of our program. So those are that's really hard to draw that connection. But certainly, you know, we've made a big effort in the last six, seven years to get to the knowledge, attitude, skills, aspirations, and the behavior change element. So okay, thanks very much. We're going to wrap it up. So I just want to thank. Claire Fackler for, so much for joining us and sharing this information and I encourage all of you to go to the Sanctuary's website where you can learn more and you can also take a look at this PowerPoint which is going to be posted on the MPA website and also on open channels. Um, thanks everyone. Goodbye. Great. Thank you.